Uh, my name is Jan Sveinar. I'm director of the uh, Center on Global Economic Governance here at Columbia and a faculty member. It's my pleasure to introduce David Madigan, Executive Vice President for Arts and Sciences and also Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Statistics who will uh, launch uh, the event and has some welcoming remarks. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, thank you, Jan. Um, I was looking at the website before I came over here, and there's a, a quote from, from Joe Stiglitz that says, in a sense, every economist of my generation is a student of Ken Arrow, influenced by, by his ideas, by his style of research, and by his breadth of vision. And I can say as a statistician, the same, uh, the same is true. Um, in that spirit, and there are many influences on statistics of, of, of uh, Professor Arrow's work. Um, in that spirit, the Arrow Lecture Series has sought to identify the boldest, most creative thinkers uh, who will steer the discipline of economics um, in a future direction, and I think it's been doing that uh, spectacularly well. Um, so first we have a lecture series, then we have the books, um, so when are we going to have the movies? Um, <laughs> and the first four books, I guess, are on the table back there, and, and many of you are familiar with them. They're, they're truly spectacular. Um, I, I think, in particular, the Stiglitz, Stiglitz Greenwald book um, on a learning society. Um, should be mandatory reading for, for every higher education leader and, and every civil servant in the world. I think the, the, the ideas can and should have profound implications uh, for the world and for our concepts about learning and lifelong learning. So, fellow Colombians, I guess many are from Colombia here, and honored guests, uh, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome you to this event. Um, I hope you have a wonderful discussion this evening and, and welcome also in advance to tomorrow's lecture. Um, and I hope you have a productive and fun session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we have also a special uh, uh, item that we'd like to start with here. Professor Ronald Findlay, who is a distinguished member of this faculty and has been for decades, will uh, say a few words in the honor of another great economist who was at Columbia, William Vickery, and it's a celebration of uh, his centennial, and so uh, we would have a few words from Ron Findlay. Ron, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. It's a, it's a great honor to uh, <clears throat> be present at this occasion and to honor my, uh, my former colleague, uh, much admired, uh, beloved uh, Bill Vickery. Now, uh, I think one thing that every economist, at least of my generation, knew about Vickery, even when we were in graduate school, was this famous story of how he used to uh, how he used to come to Columbia University. He lived in the suburbs, he would take a, take a train, and then he would roller skate from the, from the railway station to, to, uh, to Fairweather Hall uh, and, give his, and give his lectures. Uh, so if you've never seen him, he was a very tall, uh, broad-shouldered, barrel-chested man. And uh, so uh, such a man, on, not only on roller skates, but he invariably carried to his lectures a three-dimensional diagram, uh, which was consisted of a cardboard, cardboard box and uh, what we call in economics indifference surfaces, three-dimensional indifference surfaces. So normally we just write an equation on the board saying utility is a function of x1, x2, x3. But uh, Bill had this characteristic of he wanted to sort of construct and you know show everything so clearly as simply and clearly as possible. So he uh, wanted to instruct his students not just by abstractly, but he wanted to show them this picture. And he was a very gifted uh, sort of uh, physically. He could translate his concepts into sort of physical objects. So he had this card. I've never seen it, so I only go by descriptions because he had stopped doing it by the time I got to Columbia in 1969. Uh, but uh, you can imagine this very tall, large man with this strange contraption on roller skates uh, coming down, uh, you know, maybe Amsterdam or Broadway or wherever, uh, or wherever it was. So that, uh, from that little story, I think we can get some idea about uh, Vickery as an economist. But why roller skates? I mean, that, that's sort of strange. But when he was asked this question, he said, well, it's the simplest thing, because there's a slight inclined plane. And you can get from the station to the department in the easiest possible way. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can avoid uh, other people on the street. And you can just get to your, get to your destination in the quickest possible time. So all his, uh, in a strange way, all of his work uh, was 
somehow connected to that, he would find the efficient solution to practical problems. Uh, that sounds very straightforward, but uh, you know it is it's unusual, and uh, not many, not that many economists have been able to have that uh, to uh, have been able to have that uh, have been able to have that gift. Uh, and uh, in his case, uh, he was able to do this in in an in incredibly uh, successful and practical way. And the problems that he tackled were enormous problems. I was just looking through a volume of his collected papers called Public Economics that was put together 20 years ago on the occasion of his, uh, on the occasion of his 80th birthday. Uh, so the book was published in 1994. It, was, it had four editors. And uh, among the, edit the first editors in alphabetical order, it was Richard Arnott, Anthony Atkinson, Kenneth Arrow, and Jacques Dress, which is a pretty high-powered team of editors. And this team of editors, they not only collected the papers, but they sort of, you know, they put them into different categories and, uh, and wrote sm small introductions explaining uh, what each of these, uh, what each of these, what, what enormous contribution each of these papers had made. And uh, I remember, I was looking at it again today, and one sentence by the Arrow introduction to the section of Fikri's more theoretical papers. It said, uh, small paragraphs conceal great thoughts. And there's a paragraph that is quoted which contains so much. It contains, for example, this whole idea of the veil of ignorance that we associate with John Rawls. If you're doing a, a social welfare function, you want to know uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you define this, uh, this thing? Of course, John Rawls said, if you're behind a veil of ignorance, you don't know who you're going to be, then you want to make the least advantaged individual as well off as he can be, the so-called maximin criterion. Uh, Vickery instead said, well, suppose you're an immigrant, you can come into a community, and you could be, with equal probability, you could be any one of the most successful member of this community or the least successful member of this community. So what should be your social welfare function? Well, it should be the, uh, the <coughs> expected value, the sort of the, the betamite, as we say, uh, utility function. And that is the appropriate thing to maximize. So when Rawls uh, published his theory of justice in the 1970s, that this, the veil of ignorance was regarded as you know, one of the great contributions. But Vickery had had it in just you know, in a sentence or two. And uh, as uh, Professor Arrow remarked in his, in his own introduction, in the case of Vickery, there would, he would just throw things away. I mean, there wouldn't, he wouldn't sort of make a fuss. He would just say something and treat it as, as simply as obvious. So, and another thing that I want to say is not only did he find practical solutions to problems, but these were solutions that he was always motivated by uh, it sounds almost corny to say it, but he wanted to do good. I recall uh, having a discussion with my dentist, of all people, about economists and dentists. Mm -hmm. I wanted to flatter my dentist by telling him that, you know, the great Lord Keynes said that economists should think of themselves as just dentists. And I thought he would be flattered that, you know. <laughs> uh, but he said, you know, we actually do good in the world. <laughs> we relieve people of uh, suffering and pain. I'm not sure what you guys do, <laughs> but, uh, but Bill, was, uh, Bill was somebody who was motivated by reducing suffering and pain. And uh, suffering and pain in transportation, cutting down on congestion time. So we don't know, we, we, everybody knows about easy pass, but the idea behind the easy pass was Bill Vickery's, the agenda for progressive taxation. Uh, it's, it's sort of completely, you know, you, if I went on, I, would, uh, I could go on for 15 minutes talking about the problems that Vickery, the problems that Vickery worked on. Uh, just to take another example, and they're all still relevant today. Uh, there's, the, in the last election, the issue of gerrymandering was, was a big one, as you may recall. And then in this, collected, in this collection of papers, there's how to prevent gerry gerrymandering by, by, by Vickery. Uh, there's papers on the city as a firm. Uh, there's papers on you know a, a whole lot of things, and the agenda for 
practically solving these problems is still completely, uh, is still completely open. Uh, so it, uh, it is in the spirit that, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that I think we can dedicate these, these uh, four remarkable volumes uh, that have been published already as part of the Arrow Lecture Series to somebody who, uh, by, his own, uh, by his own account, had a great influence on him, which is Professor Arrow himself, and, not, and also Paul Milgram, who will be giving the Arrow Lecture tomorrow, uh, when Bill tragically died before he could give, accept his, his Nobel uh, Prize in 1996, and before he could give the lecture, uh, Paul Milgram uh, gave, uh, gave the, the lecture in his stead uh, in Stockholm. So the associations with Vickrey are very, very rich uh, at, this, at, this, at this panel. I think every one of these uh, people on the, on the panel, there's some connection uh, one can make with the work of Bill Vickrey. Uh, so thank you again, and uh, let us all remember uh, the spirit of this great and good man, uh, William Spencer Vickery, whose centenary uh, we celebrate uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ron. I just will add, I, I had my sort of personal encounter with Bill Vickery. He actually came to Central Eastern Europe when the Iron Curtain fell and, and was actually uh, uh, talking to people, advising and everything. I had the opportunity to talk to him at length in, in Prague on one of these occasions, and uh, it was a truly pleasure to, uh, to get to know him a little bit better. Uh, We've uh, assembled for you an incredible group of people here, as you know from the material that we've had here. We have very little time relative to uh, the amount of intellect that's sitting here. So you can imagine my task here trying to uh, make sure that we make uh, everything possible, squeeze everybody in here. So we'll go start uh, right here with Professor Bolton and go around the table. Everybody will say a few words in terms of how uh, Kenneth Arrow's work influenced their own work and their own career. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll allow uh, Ken Arrow to respond to that and uh, give his views of uh, what has been said. Then, uh, as you know, we have the books here that you will be all eager to get signed and buy at the end, so we'll say a few words about the books. The main authors will uh, say a few words about the books, and then we'll give a chance to you to ask uh, questions. So all this in the next uh, hour and 15 minutes. So with the usual efficiency of economists, you will see how we'll master all that uh, right here. So with that, uh, on that note, Pat Patrick? I, I was hoping that it would start at the other side of the table. But, uh, <laughs> since you've singled me out, um, I, I just wanted to say uh, this is a, a very um, special um, moment for me. Uh, it uh, just uh, reminds me how fortunate I've been uh, uh, in my professional career as an economist. Um, I was educated in economics as an undergraduate in, uh, in Cambridge, England, uh, at Churchill College. And um, um, perhaps the greatest influence uh, uh, on my, uh, my uh, future career, my thinking, was uh, from uh, Frank Hahn. And uh, of course, um, through Frank Hahn, uh, from uh, Ken Arrow and uh, all the many students, uh, uh, he has uh, he has uh, influenced and, uh, and trained. Um, in particular, um, Eric Maskin, who I was also very uh, privileged to uh, uh, have as a supervisor um, at Churchill. Um, and then uh, later on, uh, when I uh, completed my PhD, uh, I was invited uh, a few summers at the IMSSS, uh, and uh, that was also an extremely special moment. And that's when I uh, uh, got to know uh, Ken uh, uh, personally. Um, uh, in, in this week's uh, New Yorker magazine, there's an article, uh, and uh, I forget who the author is, but uh, I picked up a, a, apparently a Russian proverb. Uh, and the Russian proverb is that uh, the way influence works is like uh, uh, the way um, the knight moves in a chess game, uh, first forward and then sideways. Uh, 
Um, but I think in the case of Ken Arrow, it's like uh, forward in all, in all directions. Uh, I think it's just uh, uh, impossible to, uh, uh, you know, not to, uh, not, not to be influenced by his ideas, uh, at least at the, uh, my generation. Uh, and uh, uh, last thing I want to say is, uh, in terms of uh, more directly uh, my research, uh, I've uh, had a um, uh, and the good fortune to read uh, early enough uh, um, his book on the limits of organization. And uh, this has helped me a lot in, in my work with uh, Mathias de Watripon on, uh, on the theory of the firm. And uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. I think it would have been easier if we had been asked to, to speak about what portions of our work have not been influenced by Ken Arrow. So what I'm going to do is talk about two aspects of my research, which owe a lot to Ken's uh, pioneering research. So the Arrow book, the Arrow lecture book that uh, is sitting out there, uh, is about bubbles in asset prices. Now, as many in my generation, I learned general equilibrium theory by studying the Bohr's theory of value. <clears throat> in that book, people trade claims to payoffs of particular goods at particular points in time and events. Claims that economists call today the Arrow de Brew claims in honor of their, of their um, uh, for the first people that kind of uh, uh, imagined them. This proved to be a powerful framework to simplify the consideration of time and uncertainty in economics, but was not really a theory of prices of assets. However, very early on, Ken had written another paper uh, that shown that one could build an equivalent theory with claims that make nominal payments and then only having spot markets for goods instead of claims that pay in all types of goods. This paper, which Ken published in French in the mid-50s, is the start of the theory of asset pricing in economics. Later, the same framework was used to consider long-lived claims and thus to produce a dynamic theory of asset pricing. Everyone working on the price of assets including speculation and bubbles, owns an enormous intellectual debt to Ken. I'm going to squeeze in another, another uh, part of my research that has been very much influenced by Ken's own work and ideas. And of course, I, as many here, I met first Ken at IMSSS, and I think even earlier at Sam at Berkeley that Roy Ryder had organized. But at some point, Ken invited me to come to Santa Fe to meet a group of physicists. With a group of physicists, he invited a group of then young economists to meet with a group of physicists to discuss common methodological problems. There are many anecdotes I could tell, including when Ken corrected a physicist who was explaining to us how to model the weather. Uh, <laughs> but in that meeting, I learned enormously from Ken's emphasis on the importance of agents' interactions that are not mediated by markets. That led me naturally to think of social interactions and in general about networks in which economic agents interact with her, with, with her neighbors as opposed to interacting with an anonymous market. This, in my case, led to work in a variety of interesting social and economic problems, including the economic fluctuations that I worked with Mike, who's sitting out there, uh, with that, that framework, crime, and why cities succeed and fail. So I'll stop for here. Thank you. Okay, so I really met Ken through his work in graduate school. And for all the economists in the audience, what you learn about him first is the Arrow de Brew general equilibrium model and the impossibility theorem, which is pure theory. And then you read a paper on learning by doing. And it starts with a detailed empirical explanation of making airframes. And that was a revelation. The idea that you did not have to be just a theorist or to be a really good theorist, you would have to be informed by a creative examination of the empirical evidence was a hugely liberating experience for me and I hope has been a hugely liberating experience for all economists. So if I had to celebrate one particular thing, and I think also, by the way, I'm gonna be speaking for Amy Finkelstein who is not here, who has had, I think, from her talk, the same basic reaction. It is an appreciation of Ken Arrow, the empirical, 
economist. <laughs> and the empirical economist who, based on his prior experience as a meteorologist, was prepared to make forecasts. <laughs> And I think that if you look at the volume that Joe and I produced, it's very much about starting from a whole set of micro data that nobody looks at, that just like the airframe data, is really very difficult to explain in traditional economic terms. I mean, there are non-convexities, there are behaviors that look like they're very difficult to account for uh, without thinking about these processes of learning. When Amy came to look at medical care, there are many things about medical care that when you look at them, and Ken in his original papers looked at them empirically, just do not fit at all conventional economic models. And the work that he did, which is thinking hard about those examples and developing coherent theories for these anomalies, absolutely has informed every reform element of the healthcare system, I think not just in the United States, but around the world. So if I had to celebrate one thing, it would be Ken Arrow, the creative econometrician. <laughs> <laughs>
So this was this person that I never met, but uh, was omnipresent everywhere that I was going. And then finally, I went to a conference, an International Economic Association conference. And if I'm not wrong, you're a founding uh, father of that association. No, no, no. no. Early president. Early president. Okay, early president. That's pretty good. That's about the same. <laughs> <laughs> and so not, there, not <laughs> yeah, okay. And there you sort of saw the breadth and reach, which was amazing. And it was just that every session there was always something he could contribute and say. And uh, it was one of these eye openers where you sort of say, well, if you could do you know, one nth of uh, what uh, Ken has accomplished, then uh, you feel you're really riding high in the profession. So it was, it was a true, true pleasure to actually get to know him after reading all of these things about him. Well, in, in my case, to, to say that uh, Ken Arrow had a big influence on me uh, would be um, an understatement because uh, the fact that I'm an economist at all, actually, is, is um, Ken's fault. Uh, I, I was a math major in college, uh, and thinking of probably going on. But then, for some reason, I, I, and I can't remember exactly why it was, I, uh, I wandered into a course that Ken was teaching. It was a graduate course, so I had no uh, proper background in, in, this, in this area at all, um, on information economics. And by information economics, Ken meant anything that he happened to be thinking about at the time. <laughs> there, was, there was some information theory, uh, Shannon information theory, and there was some uh, there was some uh, moral hazard and adverse selection, a asymmetric information. There was also, uh, uh, at a very early stage, uh, some some mechanism design theory. Although I don't think it was it was called that at the time. It, uh, Leo Hurwitz and 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 that sort of work. Uh, and Ken would come in every day. Uh, half the time he would lose his notes, so so he would he would be basically talking off the cuff, and if if, if you've heard Ken speak, you know that it's it it's it's sort of like uh, listening to him is like sitting on a galloping horse and trying to hold on so you won't fall off because he he speaks very very fast. And that's because he thinks even faster, and, and, and he can't, he, fast though he is uh, in his speech, he can't keep up. So, so most of the sentences uh, are, le that, that, the, the second half of the sentence is left out. And you have to sort of fill, in, fill it in uh, yourself. Um, it was hard work, uh, but exhilarating work, and, and it, was, it was informative. <laughs> uh, which was appropriate since it was information economics. I, I, on, the, um, on the basis of that course, I changed direction and, and I signed up to do a PhD and I did it with, with Ken. So it's, uh, it's your fault, Ken. <laughs> I must say, this is, it's really wonderful listening to all these uh, discussions and, 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 and uh, of how Ken influenced people. Actually, Ken had a bigger influence on the second half of my career than he did the first. Uh, I also hadn't decided whether I was going to go into economics, and it was Bill Vickery's paper, actually, that uh, uh, coming as a mathematician that made me think, holy cow, you can use mathematics to study you know, human behavior in auctions? That was just amazing. But. Um, uh, but of course, like everybody else, I was extremely impressed by, by Ken's work as a graduate student, but I got to know Ken much better in the last uh, 25 years that I've been at Stanford, more than 25 years now. Um, and when I've had Ken come visit my class sometimes to tell graduate students about the uh, origins of the Aero de Brew model and why it's not the same as the McKenzie model and, and, uh, and talk about the origins of the impossibility theorem, and, and the standard that it sets, when you, when you listen to the stories and think about what kind of researcher you would have to be to do those things, 
So uh, when, when Ken told us about the origins of, of the impossibility theorem, he described how he was uh, uh, supposed to give a seminar in, in, uh, at the Rand Corporation one summer, and he was supposed to explain uh, the Bergson Samuelson social welfare function and, and why it was a proper, why, why it made sense uh, and to think of the United States and Russia as players in a game because that you could aggregate their preferences and create a group preference and, and uh, think of them as having payoffs. And he was supposed to lecture about this and, and tried to come up with examples and kept finding that every example was unsatisfactory in some way and finally decided maybe it's impossible. Not, now that's quite a conclusion to reach, um, and um, uh, and it was quite a conclusion to deliver on too. But Ken did, and uh, and and just listening to to that kind of story and thinking about the standard, what you're trying to achieve, what what would be an acceptable example, and what you do when you say that's not good enough, and I have to dig deeper. That that was a big one, and then the, since we're talking about the the big ones, the other big one, of course, is is general equilibrium, the Arrow de Bru theorem. And I had asked Ken in one of my classes to explain, you know, uh, some people call it the Arrow de Brew McKenzie theorem. Why why uh, was what Arrow and, and de Brew did was was different? And uh, Ken explained that you know Nash had uh, used a fixed point theorem for to prove the existence of Nash equilibrium, and uh, the idea was in the air that you could do something similar for general equilibrium, and that McKenzie had assumed. Uh, uh, continuous demand functions and used a fixed point theorem to prove the existence. But were demand functions really continuous? What happens when the price is zero? Um, and uh, so so dealing with the, uh, the issue all the way down to the fundamentals and not settling for the cheap solution, but really digging and, and delivering it and actually satisfying a solution uh, to the problem from the fundamentals, that was another part of the standard. So I, I sort of learned these things a little later in my career, uh, having not had Ken as a teacher as a graduate student, but it's been amazing. Thank you, Ken. Well, my uh, association with Ken uh, is different from uh, most other people here. I, I have uh, participated with Ken in a number of uh, uh, meetings convened by the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, particularly uh, retreats uh, take place about two and a half days going to an island uh, in the Stockholm archipelago. And this is a meeting with about 20 people, half of whom are more or less economists and half of whom are more or less ecologists. Uh, and it's the very shambolic, uh, disorganized meetings, uh, but at the end of it we have to produce a paper. And uh, Ken is always the, of course, the, the, the well, there are a lot of stars at these meetings, but Ken, the oracle, is the focal point for, for all discussion. And I've observed two traits of his in um, many of these excursions. Uh, the first is that he's, uh, despite his age, he's basically a graduate student in disposition. He is interested in absolutely everything. And the, the second uh, quality is uh, that when he talks to you, uh, he and, and imparts not only this incredible um, uh, intellectual ability, but the wealth of knowledge is, for me, completely stunning. But he, when, he, when he shares that knowledge with you, he does it uh, uh, conveying the belief that you must have the same knowledge he has, <laughs> which I'm afraid in my case is not remotely true, uh, but I do appreciate the, uh, the sentiment. Um, it makes it much easier to interact with him. Uh, you know, it is hard to say, you know, how were you influenced uh, by his work because of what hasn't been. Um, but there, there was, um, the, the thing that stood out uh, for me was similar for Patrick Bolton. It was uh, The Limits of Organization, which is a book that I thought probably attracted less uh, interest um, than perhaps it deserved. But anyway, in, in, uh, for, for me, so this is a book that is about organizations um, as basically providing a means for achieving collective action when the price system fails. So basically it's about everything else. I mean, it's about all of social interactions. And um, I was interested at the time in uh, collective action at the global level. And Ken's book is not really meant to address that, at least that's not how I read the book. But of course it provided almost everything you needed. And I'll just give one example of that. He, one of the subjects he discusses is authority. And authority you think of as being, uh, an authority as being able to impose uh, uh, punishments and uh, to give out rewards. 
Uh, and what he and, and of course, at, the reason I'm interested in this at the international level, there's no world government, so there's no one that can do this. So then, what do you do? Uh, but then he says that uh, probably even more important are other aspects of authority, particularly the focal of uh, convergent expectations, basically um, telling the parties that what they should be doing, uh, and the other that the role of authority in coordinating behavior. And the one thing that I've discovered about the entire international system, which is hopeless in many ways, of course, but it is exquisitely good at coordinating. So I think that the roots of this idea um, are to be found in a book that wasn't even intending to be about international organization. I was I was just hooked completely, and I, I had no idea about any of his other work until I came to Columbia. Uh, so I wrote a dissertation on job shop scheduling problems, which had nothing to do with the sorts of things I do today. But uh, as I was about to graduate from MIT, there was a uh, visiting professor, Rakesh Bora, who was interested in sort of using OR tools uh, to study non-standard OR problems. Uh, we studied stable matchings. And one of the problems we looked at was the problem of preference aggregation. And so I, I still remember, as I was uh, thinking about what to say, the excitement at discovering the set of papers and the book on uh, social choice and individual values. Uh, there was a version with Arrow's commentary, uh, the third edition or so. And I recall reading that book in the Lehman Library and the SIPA building in one sitting and being amazed at how somebody could even conceive of such a result. I mean, now there are you know, half a dozen different ways of proving this, uh, but I still, to this day, when I teach this in class, I have no idea how somebody could even think of formulating something like this. I'm, uh, I was in awe of, of a mind that could do this, and I still am, actually. Um, over the years, uh, every once in a while, I go back and read one of these early papers, and I'm consistently amazed by how clear uh, the writing is, how well the ideas are explained, uh, the breadth and the depth of his contributions, how timeless these uh, problems are that he's worked on. Um, and I think this is a true inspiration for uh, people in many, many disciplines. Um, so I'm reminded of this quote of Benjamin Franklin, who uh, is rumored to have said, uh, do things that are worth writing about and do something that, uh, write something that's worth reading uh, and I can't think of anyone who's done this more consistently than Arrow for the last 70 years or so. Thank you for, for all that you've done. <clears throat> There's a certain symmetry to the uh, opening and closing remarks here because Patrick, when he's speaking, said that he, uh, he was educated at Churchill College, Cambridge, which I also was, by Frank Hahn. And I met Ken Arrow there first back in the 1960s, and I met Joe there. Joe actually also taught me when I was a student there. So I have a very, uh, very honorable lineage here. Um, 
I'm going to not so much talk about what Ken's work, how Ken's work has influenced mine, because it's influenced everything I've done. I thought I'd actually talk about how Ken's work has influenced my teaching, because I teach what I think is interesting and important and exciting. Um, and I'm currently teaching the PhD course to first-year graduate students in economics. Um, and you know, Joe mentioned earlier, someone quoted Joe as saying that uh, every student of his generation was a student of Ken Harris. And I think it's actually true today. Every student in the current generation is a student of Ken Harris as well. And I just want to emphasize that point. I teach PhD students microeconomic theory. We start off by talking about consumer preferences, and we talk about the aggregation of consumer preferences, and then we talk about the arrow impossibility theory, obviously. And I like to emphasize, of course, the connection with Columbia. Um, then go on from that, we talk about choice under uncertainty. And we talk about risk and risk aversion and the management of risk. And I introduce them to the arrow Pratt index of risk aversion and various results of arrows. And inevitably, a hand goes up and says, is, is this the same arrow that, uh, that did that stuff on social choice? So yes, it's the same arrow. There's only one. Um, from there, we go on to do general equilibrium theory. Um, we talk about general equilibrium and the existence of equilibrium. And we go through the proofs by Arrow and de Brewer. Uh, and then we end up with uh, the paper that uh, um, Jose mentioned, the paper by Arrow on the optimal on the role of securities and the optimal allocation of risk bearing, which is an absolutely fundamental paper in the whole field. And by that time, the students have stopped asking, "Is this the same Arrow?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's I was thinking, I mean, this is purely coincidental, but I, I, this this is not this course was not designed as an homage to Ken. Uh, it was designed as a, a good course in contemporary issues in microeconomics and what's really important and exciting. But Ken gets ten times as many mentions as anybody else. You know, I mentioned Hicks somewhere up front when I'm talking about indifference curves and compensated demand functions. And I mentioned von Neumann and Morgenstern when we start talking about choice under uncertainty. But Ken is just a recurring theme throughout the entire course. So it's still the case, Ken, that students of economics at the graduate level are your students today. Thank you very much for setting this up. So, Ken, if you would be so kind and say a few words uh, in return. I won't <laughs> limit you time-wise, don't worry. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> I probably should engage in a refutation of all the exaggerations. <laughs> but I think I will refrain and enjoy, the, enjoy it instead. I'd rather comment on <clears throat> uh, what uh, influences on me. Because I had a somewhat peculiar career, uh, <clears throat> not totally unusual, but uh, some uh, came <clears throat> as an undergraduate. I had a good uh, training in mathematics at City College. It so, it so happened there was a logician, a very famous logician, Alfred Tarski, who was caught here by the outbreak of the war in September 1939. Um, I hope you can imagine there were people alive in 1939, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, who uh, was gave a course on theory of relations. So when I was confronted with this, uh, as uh, Paul said, on the uh, having to give a, uh, try to explain uh, the Bergson, Samuelson, well, social welfare function to, uh, stu uh, to the uh, people at Rand, I, uh, it, it, I suddenly realized I was talking about relations. Better, worse, bigger, you know, preferred by more people or whatever, so whatever form of social aggregation and that uh, problems occurred. Uh, so the, I came, but the, I had run across statistics and I came to Columbia really to study statistics, not to study economics. It happened there was no such thing as a statistics department. Uh, I think there was none anywhere in the United States at that point. And the professor who taught statistics was a man named, a name that still resonates, I believe, Harold Hotelling, who was a, the, who was a professor of economics, but his, he was teaching statistics. However, he, he did have an independent interest in economics. He had written, in fact, several papers of the most of, of great importance in pure economics, not the bottom, but he's also a statistician. So, as uh, there's been some reference to my uh, empirical uh, references, uh, I do try to keep up. I have not done the kind of empirical work I thought I would do when I was when I was younger. I thought I'd have a bigger share of my life, but at least I'm a consumer and reproducer and learner, and that was partly, of course, the fact that any statistician, by definition, that's what the that's what the trade is about, is using is using kind of that's what uh, telling expected people to do and so forth. And uh, 
So between, I got more into economic theory because of hotelling's influence than I had gotten uh, before. It was a wonderful experience. He, uh, he was a great man, a great pioneer. And he also had brought along, he was trying to create a statistics thing with no support from the university. He got some outside money. Uh, he had some money for, for a research assistant whom he promptly used to teach courses and not to, because uh, that he wanted to disseminate the thing. And he picked up a refugee named Abraham Walt, who was, uh, you know, had essentially no status, but the first lecture you heard from him, you knew, you knew in the presence of a great mind. There was no, uh, no, no question about that. He was considerably more systematic than, than hoteling. So these, are the, but the other, and the other thing is, as Mary suggested, is that uh, over the years I've tried to respond. You know, I've, the department here was very mixed. There was a very strong empirical wing, as a matter of fact. In fact, that was dominated by as people whose names may not re resonate much today: Wesley Clare Mitchell and uh, uh, Arthur F. Burns. Actually, Burns wasn't even a member of the faculty, but he, Mitchell was on leave and Burns was taking over. He stayed on, of course, subsequently. Um, and uh, he had the ideas of statistical analysis of business cycles, which coming from mathematical statistics, I thought were just plain silly. <laughs> uh, and they have not paid; they have not been used. So I think the uh, verdict of history is okay. But <laughs> he was a great man, and the, the, the idea that you, the, the, any idea that statisticians ought to be testing theories by rigorous analysis was fully reinforced by him. He didn't think the models were. He didn't think the idea of modeling was of any importance, but the idea of uh, but his knowledge of what was going on in business cycles was uh, unprecedented. And he spurred the moment saying, well, no, it didn't work that way out in the business cycle in France in 1924. <laughs> so, you know, any generalization you can think of. Uh, Columbia was a great place in many ways. It was a little mixed. It, got, it became more unified and, uh, after the, when I returned after the war with um, um, Vickery was just starting out as a junior member of the faculty then, and I uh, uh, had some contact with him, and particularly by his dissertation on uh, an agenda for progressive income taxation. There's a thought that a number of these brilliant ideas, which uh, combined theoretical relevance with empirical, with, with practicality, not so much empirical, but, but that they could, they, they, you could look like, and nevertheless, have never found their way into legislation. <laughs> uh, so uh, it gets a somewhat eerie feeling because these are, his ideas really were designed to be used and were trimmed to be kept. And nevertheless, uh, yeah, and they were very ingenious. So uh, I don't want to take the time to go into it. But the, then, of course, later, it kept, the, the, this auction set everybody on fire. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that, of course, has already been hinted at is that my training statistics really led me to great interest in uncertainty and risk bearing and so forth. And then I began to get this, they began to acquire again because somebody asked me a question dealing um, with medical economics. And I was puzzled by some features of it and finally decided it was all had to do with asymmetric information. That's where I came to this. That, that lecture was, was from a somewhat general audience and, that you referred to. And uh, didn't go into the details, but uh, uh, the idea that that an essential component is the fact that people know different things, that information is a commodity, not like other commodities, and so forth, which I think the consequences of things still need to be fully unraveled because they're not. We don't. We, don't, we see them. You can see them plainly in the in the latest uh, crisis of 2008 that, that shows up the differences in information and belief and the, the role they played in the, what is a, a, a very large, not a, not a marginal variation on a, on a theme, but a very large change in perspective. So I, look for, I believe that there's the world of, of, I think economics is kind of an endless science. It's got its, its problems because in a sense we're talking about ourselves. And so I think there's always a sense in which we can't really <laughs> get away from it. You, you can sort of look at <laughs> bugs. <laughs> <laughs> a lot better. A lot better. You can look at planets with even more uh, detachment, but I think there's going to be an essential problem in uh, in ever dealing. But nevertheless, well, it's an impossibility if you like. But it doesn't mean we can't keep on trying. Thank you.
So as you know, uh, this is part of a uh, uh, book signing uh, ceremony which we have here. We have uh, actually something really remarkable. We have uh, uh, a group of economists who all agreed to deliver lectures, and they delivered these uh, special honor lectures. Uh, they not only did that, they wrote books, and those books happened to be published almost simultaneously, four of them, there will be more coming. Uh, so we have an occasion today to actually uh, witness the uh, inauguration of these books. So I will let the authors now uh, say a few words about each. The first one is by Eric Maskin and Amartya Sen, the Arrow Impossibility Theorem. Uh, then we have Amy Finkelstein on moral hazard in health economics, uh, influenced very much by the paper that was mentioned that Ken Arrow wrote uh, in this area. Um, Amy cannot be here today, but there is actually a little piece inside there also by Joe Stiglitz and Bruce Greenwald, so Bruce agreed that he would actually introduce the book. We have Jose Shankman here on speculation, trading, and bubbles. Jose will uh, say a few words about uh, that book. And then um, the thickest uh, and most <laughs> recent is Creating a Learning Society by Joe Stiglitz and Bruce Greenwald. So we probably should start with this one, right? It's uh, sort of that. So this is economists now um, making foray into advertising. So here we'll start with, uh, <laughs> I'll distribute the books and we'll have time to uh, discuss them. If you can say a few words. Okay, well, let me just say a, a few words. Each, each of the uh, Arrow Lectures uh, was organized around uh, one of King's papers. And one of the things why we were excited about having the lecture series, uh, not only to honor, I think, uh, one of Columbia, uh, Columbia's most distinguished graduates, but also because uh, the breadth of the, his work meant that we could have a lecture on a almost a totally different topic every year without repeating. <laughs> and we could, we could keep getting uh, d different people to come give lectures, and it would be very stimulating for the, for, the, for the university. And it was not only were they touching on issues in economics, but as we see operations, research, statistics, philosophy, you know, is, uh, political science. So it was actually cutting across a large number of themes, which is why it was a, a university uh, event. So this uh, particular uh, book was influenced by uh, the paper that Bruce referred to that uh, Ken published in 1962. The 1960s was a period in which everybody was excited about growth, try to understand growth. And uh, in 1957, Bob Solo had come to the view, had shown empirically that uh, uh, some 80% of all growth was related to technical change, or what was called at the time the solo residual, that it was, wasn't explained by capital accumulation. That was really uh, what, what it said. But uh, there wasn't much understanding of what, what uh, led to the uh, increase in productivity year after year. And King's paper in 62, actually he had two papers in 62. Uh, there were two different theories of what uh, caused uh, increases in productivity. One of them was a, a, a paper uh, on uh, R&D that he wrote and how explicit allocation of resources to, to research led to increases in productivity and the economics of R&D really started a whole literature on uh, the economics of R&D. But the second one was on learning by doing, that by doing things you learn more and you increase your productivity, and that was the airframe study that Bruce uh, referred to uh, earlier. And that was really the inspiration uh, of this book. Um, it began, uh, like so many things, you know, with a, with a little paper, uh, and then <laughs> that little paper grew and grew. and it maybe <laughs> So uh, it, the 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 uh, basic uh, uh, question was, if uh, there is uh, this learning associated with doing, what does that do to our understanding of what is uh, uh, how markets work? Uh, Will markets normally be competitive? Will markets normally be efficient? 
And then a correlate of that is what does that do to our beliefs about what are appropriate policies? If markets are efficient, of course, you don't need to intervene, and that's Adam Smith's invisible hand. But the central in insight was that in this world where you're, you know, uh, you, you, what you do affects what you know, what you're learning, it turns out that the market is essentially never efficient. And that means all the propositions about what good economic policy have to be rethought. And uh, this provides a lens through which you can see every aspect of policy because while economists in the past have focused on how do you affect allocative efficiency, improve the efficiency of the allocation resources, or lead to more savings, increase the amount of capital, what we said is the core issue is how do you learn more? How do you become more productive? And so what we said is the focus of our attention, since most of increases of standard of living have to do with increases in productivity, the focus of economists' attention ought to be more on what we can do to promote learning in our society. So that's, and it's not just the economy, it's, it's, it's talking about how to create a learning society. An interesting thing, I was just in um, Netherlands uh, uh, a little over a week, <clears throat> a week ago, actually. And um, their uh, national government policy now is about creating a learning economy. So I, ideas spread, and, and, and uh, it, it, it does provide a, a new framework for thinking about uh, growth and development. Yeah, Bruce, I'm not going to add to that. I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm now going to. Very bad. Sorry, I'm now going to channel Amy Fick Finkelstein probably very badly. Uh, so don't blame her. <clears throat> Medical care is clearly an area where standard economic prescriptions don't apply. And they don't apply for two obvious reasons. You can't have consumer sovereignty. Because consumers, it's like getting your car fixed. You don't know what you need. You're in the hands of somebody who decides what you need who has superior information and incentives to provide a lot of what you don't need. So especially if you're a professor here, you're one of the most over-maintained and badly maintained pieces of equipment out there. <laughs> and that's a problem of moral hazard that Ken Arrow uh, clearly identified and is pervasive in the effort to reform medical care, which is what this book is about. But there's a second other large problem, and it's the problem that Healthcare expenditures are episodic and they're very unevenly distributed among the population. It's a classic case where you have to have insurance. But the problem is the people buying the insurance have better knowledge about when they're sick than the people who are selling the insurance. So you have a moral, an adverse selection problem of who signs up for insurance and when they sign up for insurance. So you clearly, in a sense, want to institutionalize the structure of medical care. And you want to do it to take account of the problems that can identify. So you first attempt at that is to have competitive insurance companies. The insurance companies have lots of knowledge from lots of patients about what should be done. They use that knowledge to restrict the practice of doctors and offer the doctors incentives. And at the same time, of course, they have gating functions that select patients. And of course, the bad condition there, bad situation there is that if you have a prior condition and you have to switch insurance, it's going to be difficult to do. So the next step in intervention is you want to force everybody to have insurance. And that's clearly a big part of the insurance reform. And again, these are things that uh, Ken identified in that uh, original paper. But then the problem, of course, gets just not eliminated. It gets transferred to a different area. Because now the insurance companies have real incentives to try and select populations that are favorably disposed. So if I'm going to offer Medicare insurance, I want to offer it along with gym membership so that I get all the healthy people who are old but like to work out. And that competitive process 
can undermine the effectiveness of insurance policies. So the next thing is you want a single payer system. And that's where the logic of single payer comes out. And again, that's a natural development of these informational problems that can identified, which suggests that you're going to have the government then provide a single standard and a single form of insurance. But then the problem is nobody really trusts the government to do that in a sensible way. So in the end, it turns out not only is Ken's work, which Amy develops on health insurance, absolutely a guide to the way you go, but ultimately you run into the impossibility theorem. <laughs> It's always <clears throat> difficult to follow Bruce. Uh, it's not a wonder that he's the most popular teacher at, at the business school here. Um, so, but let me try. Um, <clears throat> let me start by saying it's fair to say that uh, there's no, not much agreement among economists about what happens in episodes that we call asset price bubbles. Uh, there are numerous academic papers and books that are written explaining why the prices attained in a particular episode can be justified by economic actors rationally discounting future streams of payoff. Um, in particular, you know, there are papers like this written about the, the, the technology, the internet bubble. Now, so what I did in this Aero lecture is try to summarize work that I have done with many colleagues. Petr Patrick Bolton has been one of my co-authors, Hanson Hong and Wei Shong and others, um, which is an attempt to go beyond the narrow theme of the behavior of prices. What I, st I started in this book by using historical episodes, the South Sea bubble, the extraordinary rise of stock prices during the Roaring Twenties, the internet bubble, and the recent credit bubble to illustrate three stylized facts. The first is that asset price bubbles coincide with increase in trading volume. People trade a lot during asset price bubbles. The second is that asset price bubble deflations don't occur because all of a sudden people realize the price of the asset, they have an attack of rationality and realize that assets are trading at very high values. But typically, they are deflated by an increase in the asset supply. And the third is that asset price bubbles often occur in times of financial or technological innovation. So in the, in the lecture, I argued that a model of bubbles, which are based in, in two principles, first, on the presence of fluctuating heterogeneous beliefs among investors. Ken already mentioned the question of difference of beliefs. And any symmetry between the cost of acquiring an asset and the cost of shorting that same asset can be used to explain these observations. I also discuss some additional, more systematic evidence besides the evidence that I mentioned. But let me tell you what this model does, because it highlights some, what I think are important elements of bubbles. First is the presence of optimists. Without the optimists, without the rise of optimism, it's impossible to have a bubble. But on top of having optimists, you need fluctuations in the beliefs. Most bubbles, people, the optimists that buy, they don't buy an asset hoping to hold it forever, because that's going to give them their economic independence for all. You know, I used to say, most people here are probably too young for that, but sometimes people were buying in the 1990s, they were buying shares of Amazon for $400 a share. But people who are buying shares of Amazon for $400 a share, do not think Amazon was gonna pay a dividend. I don't think Amazon never, ever paid never, a dividend. Never. Ever paid a dividend. Never bought, <laughs> back, a share, so. never bought back a share. But I think they were not hoping that Amazon was going to pay a large dividend. And with the dividends, they're gonna retire in Monte Carlo. I think the reason they were buying the, uh, uh, this stock at $400, they thought maybe tomorrow somebody's gonna pay 450 for them. And it's this view that even though I may be optimist today, a crazier, more optimist person may come in tomorrow is very important to sustain bubbles. The third is the role of leverage. Why? Because there's only a certain number of optimists. And if they cannot get leverage, they cannot buy that much. You know? mm -hmm. So leverage plays a very important role. The fourth is, as I said, the role of supply in satisfying the demand of the optimists and eventually bursting, bu bursting bubbles. So for instance, uh, any asset price bubble, there's enormous gains for creating additional assets. In the late 90s, for instance, everybody was starting an internet company, 
and floating the shares as fast as possible. An extraordinary number of shares were floated in the first half of 2000. In fact, venture capital uh, firms that had distributed less than $4 billion to their limited partners in the third quarter of 1999 distributed $21 billion in the first quarter of 2000. Eventually, the marginal buyer of these shares had to be a less optimistic individual. The same thing can be seen in the last, in the last um, bubble. Um, if initially, there was this incredible demand for AAA rated US debt, usually mortgage based. And, but at some point, somebody figured out, and to build, it, initially at least, to supply this debt, you had to build houses in Arizona. And that's why you go to Arizona, you see this row of houses being, that were built at that time. Eventually, somebody had a brilliant idea of creating the synthetic CDO. I'm not going to describe them to you here. It's described in the book. But, or you can get an even better description, Marco Lewis's book. Uh, but the synthetic CDO was basically a way of creating assets, bonds, that could satisfy e the demand of even the most optimistic bank in Dusseldorf, as they used to say at the time, for AAA rated US debt without ever being building a single house. So it is this, these elements that I, that I emphasize in the book. But as I said here, and Jeff already mentioned, all this comes from a development in the theory of asset pricing that was started by Ken. <laughs> so, uh, this book, um, which uh, Amartya, Amartya Sen and I put together, is uh, called the Arrow Impossibility Theorem. I, I think that will tell many of you what it's about. Uh, for, for those of you who uh, don't know what the Impossibility Theorem is, it, it's, been, it's been referred to. Uh, uh, but l let me say a little bit more precisely what it what it says, uh, the, and I'm going to reformulate it slightly, uh, but but not uh, not grossly. Uh, imagine that you want to conduct an election for for some office. Say say you want to elect a president, and there are a number of candidates for presidents, and you want to make sure that the candidate who gets elected reflects the preferences of the voters. Now, but there are lots of different voting systems that could be used. Uh, you could use plurality rule, you could use majority rule, you could use uh, runoff voting. Uh, which one should you use? Well, what, what Ken suggested is that we break down the uh, question of, of what voting rule we should use into its component parts. Let, let's state some criteria, some axioms that we want any good voting rule to satisfy. So one, one uh, axiom or criterion is what economists call the Pareto rule. If everybody agrees that candidate X is better than candidate Y, then why shouldn't get elected? That, that, that seems pretty natural. Uh, uh, another property, uh, and, and now I'm going to strengthen one of the conditions, is that, that, that every voter should, should have a say. Uh, uh, we could, we could uh, state this as the, the, the one person, one vote axiom. Every, vo voters should count, should count equally. Uh, Another property uh, is the idea that uh, if some candidates uh, who's not going to get elected decides to drop out, that shouldn't change the, the outcome of the election. A, 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 a famous instance where the, the system that we actually use here in the US violated that principle, what, for those of you who are old enough to remember it, uh, was the 2000 US presidential election where uh, everything came down to the state of Florida. Uh, there, were, there were three candidates uh, of, of note, uh, 
George W. Bush, who, who won the election, Al Gore, who some people thought won the election, and, and a third candidate, uh, Ralph Nader. Uh, well, it turns out that Ralph Nader changed the outcome of the election because Bush ended up getting fewer than 600 more votes than, than Gore, at least by, allegedly, allegedly by, by, according to the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, and so, so he won Florida. But almost 100,000 voters voted for Nader in Florida. And, and we have a lot of evidence suggesting that if Nader had not been on the ballot, most of those votes would have gone to Gore. So Gore would not only have won Florida, but he would have won Florida decisively. That's a violation of what Ken called the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Nader was an irrelevant alternative. He was never going to win, but he changed the outcome by his presence on the ballot. Well, suppose you ask for a voting rule that satisfies these principles, Pareto, uh, equal, equal weight for voters, and independence. There's no, there's no voting rule that satisfies all those properties, at least all the time. That is for any preferences that voters uh, might have. Uh, and that's, that was uh, an unexpected result, and it's been a very influential result. It's a very powerful result, uh, because it tells us what, what we cannot do. But, but it also points in various directions for what we might be able to do. And uh, in, in this book, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the topics under discussion is what would happen if we insisted that the arrow axioms be satisfied, but not for for all possible preferences, that we know can't be done, but for as big a class as possible, uh, what, what voting rules would we end up with if, if we ask that the axioms be satisfied as often as possible? Well, it, it turns out uh, that there's a, a sharp answer to that question. Um, it's, it's majority rule. Uh, majority rule says we, we, we pick the candidates uh, that, according to all pairwise comparisons, would beat each other candidates by a majority. Um, that, um, that, re that possibility results, uh, as well as uh, many others that, that are identified in the book, uh, was made possible uh, by an impossibility <laughs> theorem. And, and, and uh, it, 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 it's opening up these possibilities that makes the impossibility theorem so important. So we indeed have a few minutes for questions and answers. So I would invite you to. Uh, uh, Come to the microphone, uh, ask uh, either Ken Arrow, the authors, uh, anybody this time is reserved for you before we move to the next, uh, uh, next part of the, uh, of the program. Don't be shy. I mean, this is, this is your time. Yep. Do you come here? No, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's just stuck. Yeah, very good. Um, good afternoon. It's very, I'm a current graduate student in the program in economic policy management, the MPA program at SIPA. Um, I'm very, very excited. I'm almost trembling. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm going to ask a very particular question. You, during your lifespan, and this is for most of you who are economists, what aspects or what question you said, I'll, I'll deal with this question later. Let me just develop this theory first and I'll do this other question later that someone, whether someone else later on actually did it for you. 
is there someone, an economist, that literally surprised you and got the answer first? <laughs> Thank you. In case it happened to you. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, uh, you think about the problems, and I, uh, for example, I've been thinking about over, over many years about <clears throat> applying my, it's the rate of discount. It's a very old interest of mine. I haven't done anything very dramatic in it. Uh, <clears throat> and quite often I've thought about, well, let's introduce uncertainty. Then I pick up the journal and there's Christian Gaulier or someone like that. <laughs> Who did it? <laughs> this happens all the time. In fact, the, even the um, general equilibrium theorem, the existence of general equilibrium, was uh, what, see, one, the, real, the real point was that John Nash had introduced a certain mechanism a certain way of looking at problems. And it occurred to about five different people at least that I know of, and very possibly more, who said, oh, this is going to explain why or under what conditions general competitive equilibrium has a uh, equilibrium, because it's very much like a game. It's not exactly a game, but it's uh, sort of like it. And it turned out, to, well, Mc Lionel McKenzie, Gerard de Bruyne and I did it. it we, didn't, we didn't collaborate, actually. We developed it independently and discovered that we had developed it independently and, and uh, joined forces to, to make a joint paper out of it because we were, we were relatively close. We were relatively close contact. And there were several others, uh, Hukukani Nakado, uh, uh, well, uh, what's that, David Gale. There were several others who, uh, who were on the same track. Because that was one of those things where there, were, where, t where there was a big technical development which enabled, and a lot of people could see that in one form or another, this was the, the right thing to do. So that's one, one way in which people scope. Others is, well, you, you know, you got a limited amount of time, you work on one thing, you're thinking about something else, but you, you, you put it aside, as, as you say, and someone else thinks about it. Sure, this, I think this happens, but not, not any, I mean, I'm just giving the examples that happen to me, but I think it's, it's a perfectly standard thing that everybody else, or you, you get there first and somebody else <laughs> is upset. Sure. <laughs> All right, do we have one more question? We still have a couple of minutes. Uh, we don't have to, but if there is a burning question, this is your chance. No one, well, you'll have a chance during the informal part. So let me just say that um, uh, the program today is uh, sponsored by the Columbia Economics Department's Program for Economic Research. And uh, we have the current director, Ricardo Reyes, here, and former director, Mike Woodford, who is here. So uh, we should acknowledge the fact that they've been working in this uh, area for a long time and we have to thank them with Joe Stiglitz uh, who started the Committee on Global Thought which is another cooperating institution here. It's a pleasure for the Center on Global Economic Governance to have partnership in this and I think we all have to also thank Robin Stevenson who has been uh, the sort of uh, force the to the force behind all this. So uh, let me uh, conclude this part by stressing that tomorrow we have the next lecture. Uh, Paul Milgram will be delivering it tomorrow. <coughs> so you all are expected to come and bring your friends and <laughs> relatives, etc. And at this point, we'll end this part. The authors will stay here. You're welcome to bring the book for signing and uh, talk to everybody and so on. There is a reception. So uh, welcome to the less formal part of the evening. And join me in thanking all the participants here, Professor Aaron.